The year 1600, the stage, Ireland. O'Neill has taken control of the island, and the English are surrounded. They must put their hopes into a new Lord Deputy, one that would turn the tide of the war. Following Lord Essex's failures in Ireland and the expansion of Irish control, Ireland was considered a near lost kingdom. By early 1600, O'Neill had marched the length of Ireland to Munster. The Pale was surrounded, and O'Donnell had been raiding in County Clare. The English had to take a step back and rethink their strategy. The Crown had gone through many of their best military leaders in Ireland, with them either dying or simply coming up short against the Irish forces. But this would all change when the Crown appointed Lord Mountjoy as the new Lord Deputy of Ireland. Unlike his predecessors, Mountjoy would not underestimate the Irish. He understood why the Irish were winning the war, and made changes to reflect this. Mountjoy started to mirror O'Neill's battle tactics within his own forces. His troops started wearing less armour, increasing their mobility and more troops were equipped with light firearms. Mountjoy also copied O'Neill's use of light swordsmen that would protect the cavalrymen in battle. On the 24th of February, 1600, Mountjoy landed in Ireland as Lord Deputy. He dispatched Sir Henry Dockra with an army of 4,200 to the shores of Loch Foyle in the northwest of Ulster. At the same time, in order to divert O'Neill's attention, Mountjoy marched north from Dublin, moving on Ulster. O'Neill then left Munster and made for Ulster, at an incredible pace of upwards of 30 miles a day. Mountjoy saw this and understood what it meant. Yes, O'Neill had almost the entirety of Ireland under his control, but it was Ulster that was most important to him. Even though the forces on the foil couldn't do much without local guides, it forced O'Neill to draw soldiers from the south to secure the area. This weakened O'Neill's alliances in the south. Without O'Neill's soldiers to enforce his will over the Irish lords, they eventually started to act of their own accord. Throughout the summer of 1600, Mountjoy focused his operations on the Midlands, raiding around Philipstown in July. Another campaign was made into Kildare and Leash in August. The Irish, under Captain Richard Tyrrell, attempted to block Mountjoy at the Pass of Cashel, south of Maryborough. However, a secret deal between the Lord Deputy and Donald Spogna Kavanagh resulted in the latter abandoning his positions on the Irish right wing. The Kavanaghs were the kings of Leinster from the 12th century onwards. Their coat of arms, a red lion and two crescent moons. Their motto, peace and plenty. The English assaulted Tyrrell's flank, causing him to retreat, though the speed of the Irish ensured there was few losses on either side. Though Mountjoy's efforts were not producing any singularly impressive victories, he was making steady progress. English pressure on the Irish lords in the Midlands cut the lines of supply from O'Neill to his allies in the south, causing shortages of munitions and disrupting O'Neill's ability to control Irish lords outside of Ulster. This proved crucial in the eventual overthrow of the Irish Confederation. But this could only be seen with hindsight. To many in England, Mountjoy's campaign appeared to repeat the failures of earlier deputies such as Essex. Consequently, the political pressure for tangible results mounted. On the 17th of September 1600, Mountjoy set out from Dundalk, intending to march to Newry, then on to Armagh. The route would take him through the Moiry Pass, also known as the Gap of the North. O'Neill had the pass well defended with lines of trenches, barricaded with earth and stone, and created cover for themselves by twisting low-growing trees together. Mountjoy reached the pass on the 20th of September and set up camp to the south. The Irish harassed the English with gunfire during the night, and there were skirmishes between the camp and the mouth of the pass. The weather closed in and was so poor that Mountjoy's men were barely able to light their fires, let alone move on O'Neill. Mountjoy sent scouts west to find a way to bypass O'Neill, but high water levels and marshy ground compelled them to turn back after just two miles. 
Finally, on the 25th of September, the weather cleared, and Mountjoy sent a unit of 100 men into the pass. After heavy fighting, they identified the Irish Defence Works and returned to camp with 12 dead and 30 wounded. On the 2nd of October, after six days of heavy rain, Irish cavalry emerged to mock the English, asking if the English churls would attempt to pass when they had finished their dinner, causing Mountjoy to muster five of his regiments for action. Sir Samuel Bagenal led his regiment of infantry into the pass at the head of four other regiments. The English breached the first barricade, and Thomas Burke's regiment then led the way to the second line of defence. The English endured volleys of shot from the front and flanks. Burke's men started to waver, falling down on their knees for fear. Burke, with some others, took his colours and threw them over the obstacle, then leapt over himself, forcing the defenders to withdraw. A troop of horse under Sir William Godolphin charged to support a regiment on the left, forcing the Irish back but losing two men in the process. The Irish poured fire into the attacking English from terrifyingly close range, Godolphin's own horse being shot in the head so that the brains dashed about his master's face. O'Neill's men had elevated positions and were protected from English fire behind cover. The battle raged for four hours, but despite the ferocity of the engagement, the English could not break past the third barricade. Mountjoy ordered a retreat from the pass, but as the men pulled back, the Irish closed in on them. The retreating English were forced to fight their way out of the pass. On Sunday, the 5th of October, Mountjoy made one last effort to breach O'Neill's defences. Mountjoy again moved out with five regiments supported by 100 horse. He took three regiments to the first barricade, while Sir Charles Percy and Sir Oliver St John launched a flanking attack on the heights to the left of the Irish defences. Percy pushed his 230 men forward, skirmishing with the Irish shot, but he managed to outpace St John's men, who were delayed by the steepness of the terrain. Isolated, Percy was closely charged by 300 Irish to his front and flanks. His men charged on all sides to hold back the Irish, maintaining their position until gunfire sent forward by St John made contact. Eventually, Percy and St John would fall back, though O'Neill's men may have also had enough as they did not pursue them down the hill. The following day, Mountjoy drew out the army to see what stomachs the rogues had to fight. But the Irish did not engage, and the English did not assault the Irish defences. O'Neill wanted Mountjoy to waste his strength assaulting the defences, whereas Mountjoy hoped to encounter the Irish in the open, where they would gain the edge over the Irish with their armoured horse and heavy infantry. Neither commander would surrender their advantage, therefore no battle occurred. By now, the English army was in a sorry condition. Mountjoy's men had been camped on the hill for over two weeks in atrocious weather conditions. The army had lost more men to sickness and desertion than in combat. Mountjoy claimed his force lost only 200 men in the fighting, though this may be a considerable underestimate. The Irish casualties were given by the English as an incredible 900 to 1200 killed and wounded, but given the Irish use of defences, this figure was highly unlikely. Mountjoy still planned to take the pass, but had to pull back to reorganise and refresh his weather-beaten troops. On the 14th of October, however, word reached Mountjoy that O'Neill had abandoned the pass, most likely due to being low on ammunition and food, and fearing a flanking attack from Newry. Mountjoy mustered his forces on the 17th of October and entered the pass. The barricades were destroyed, and the woods and brush cut back, making it more accessible. Mountjoy finally entered Newry on the 22nd of October, where he waited to receive supplies and reinforcements before pushing northwards towards Armagh. And by Sunday the 2nd of November, he set up camp at Mount Norris, where he left a garrison of 400 men. Sir Henry Dockra, who had landed on the foil with 4,000 men, showed remarkable skill in fostering divisions in the leading Irish clans. He gained the support of several prominent Irish chieftains, including Niall Garve O'Donnell, Red Hugh O'Donnell's cousin, who was left in charge of the area while Red Hugh was raiding in County Clare. 
he also gained the support of the O'Doherty clan, who had traditionally accepted the overlordship of the O'Donnells, but had ambitions to become freeholders under English rule. With the help of Niall Garve O'Donnell, Dockra secured the town of Lifford in October 1600, an important strategic location of the O'Donnells. Mountjoy, fearing O'Neill had returned to Moiry Pass, decided to return to Dundalk via Carlingford. Mountjoy was so concerned for the security of his army that he took Newry's entire garrison for his march south, leaving the town defenceless, forcing the townspeople to beat drums and place sentries on the walls to hide the fact that the garrison had left with Mountjoy. This was not a victorious army returning from a successful expedition into Ulster, but one escaping while it still had the strength to do so. He marched down the eastern bank of the Newry River on the 12th of November and started to ferry his men across to the western shore. O'Neill withdrew a small force of 400 men 7 kilometres south in full view of Mountjoy. The column moved out early in the morning to take advantage of the low tide to move the baggage train along the beach. As the lead troops entered the pass, the Irish opened fire on them from fortifications cut into the steep hillside. O'Neill's men held trenches blocking the road, but the leading English regiment pushed them back, enabling the baggage to pass through. The engagement raged for two hours, but eventually, Mountjoy's troops pressed through to Carlingford. Mountjoy then moved on to Dundalk, where they stayed for the winter. To the south, George Carew managed more or less to end the Munster Rebellion by the summer of 1601. He had retaken most of the principal castles and scattered the Irish forces. He did this by negotiating a pact with Florence McCarthy, which allowed McCarthy to be neutral, while Carew concentrated on attacking the force of James Fitzthomas Fitzgerald, who commanded the main rebel force. As a result, McCarthy did not come to Fitzthomas's aid, despite urges from O'Neill and O'Donnell to do so. Carew reported to London that he had, over the summer, killed 1,200 rebels and taken the surrenders of over 10,000. Carew also weakened Florence McCarthy's position by recruiting a rival McCarthy chieftain, Donnell, to English service. By June 1601, James Fitzthomas was captured by the English forces. Shortly afterwards, Carew had Florence McCarthy arrested after summoning him for negotiations. Most of the other lords submitted, and O'Neill's mercenaries had been expelled from the province. To the north, Mountjoy had also secured the surrender of O'Neill's ally, McGuinness. With Mountjoy to the south, Dockra and Derry, and Carrick Fergus under the control of Arthur Chichester, Ulster was being constricted, and O'Neill's position was weakening. Dockra and Chichester, helped by Niall Garv O'Donnell, devastated the countryside in an effort to provoke a famine and killed the civilian population at random. Their military assumption was that without crops, people or cattle, the rebels could neither feed themselves or raise new fighters. Now more than ever, O'Neill and his allies would need aid from outside of Ireland. And that aid would come from the world's strongest power at the time, the Spanish. I'd like to give a special thanks to Jim O'Neill for providing detailed maps on the Moiry Pass. Be sure to check out his book if you'd like to learn more on the Nine Years' War.